you know, everything was such a such a gamble and everything was seemed like it was like um, so much luck involved. And it was, um, you know, then within an hour, within a week, we were back at the main base and then we got called out on this um, helicopter uh, on the helicopters. Um, there was a big Chinook, which is a double bladed um, helicopters uh, carry a lot of troops. One of those had gone down in, in some thick stuff. And so they, they said, go get ready. You got to scramble. We got to get out to the helicopter pad because we're going to be coming to pick you up. Now, I was taught in, in the uh, back in the States, they showed us the helicopters and they showed us where everybody sat in the helicopters, where everybody had a seat and everybody. And that's, well, come to find out when you got there, here comes the helicopters to pick you up. There's no seats. You just jump in, hold on and you go out and. And the, and the door gunner is saying well, on the way out, when I tell you to get jump, you jump, he says, uh, because we're not, they're not going to land. They're just going to sweep in um, down low in this, in this uh, clearing, in this like jungle atmosphere, but a clearing. Um, so there we go, we go, here we go in. And this is my first time on a helicopter. And the gun, the door gunner is shooting and the helicopters are shooting and everybody's blasting away. And and it was like water, like there was a couple of feet of water in this area that was marshy. And I, I, when it would come down, they're probably about five feet off the ground. They said, well, now jump. And they're just, they're just slowing down enough for you to jump. So I jump out of there and I had that radio on my back. That radio was called a, a Prick 25 because it weighed 25 pounds. Um, and um, I just went like face first. This thing. this is not like a John Wayne scene. I said to myself, I mean, this is crazy. And you didn't know. Um, I'm looking to see if I can see any fire coming, you know, gunfire coming back. And, and you just there's a lot of shooting going on, and you don't even know what you're um, um, you're laying out some gunfire just so, as a defensive thing. Um, so we circled the helicopter, and things calmed down, and and um, we waited for a big crane helicopter to come and get this helicopter out of there. You're trying to look around and see if anybody's getting hit, um, see if anybody is being shot at the same time, seeing if there's, you know, you're, you're wondering what's going on because, and you're, and first of all, I ended up like face first in the mud. Um, and then by the time you're scrambling around, you're, 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 you're looking at where do I get to cover and what do we do now? Um, and we just advanced out away from the helicopters because there was some other guys coming in right behind us, um, just doing the same exact thing. We probably had five helicopters um just sweeping in and guys jumping off and scrambling around um so you really didn't know what you didn't i mean there was nobody right there with you telling you what to do I and mean, you just you just kind of follow the leader and, and scramble to the to the perimeter my best friend growing up came to me just before i mean i probably had a month before i was going to be drafted and he came to me and says you know the they have a program where you can sign up on on unassigned, meaning you had two years, but you couldn't pick your job. You couldn't pick anything, but you could go for two years. Same as the draft, except one thing was we got to um, sign up and then you had 90 days before you had to report. So we did that. I did that right away. We, we did that and it kept me out for the summer. So I went, I went into September with my, one of my best friends um, to Fort Dix. When I went into the army, I didn't know he was going to do this, but um, I was only in Fort Dix probably three weeks, and my brother and another friend of his were at the community college. They uh, dropped out of the college and, and signed up and came in right away. So he ended up in Fort Dix, and this is in New Jersey, um, probably three to four weeks after I was in. He, he just said, decided to go in, get it over with, and be done with it. So he did the same thing, two years on a sign. So now there was like four of us who were all unassigned um, that grew up together in, 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 in high school and all that were down at Fort Dix um, waiting to see what they were going to do with us. But they came to us actually just before we were assigned, um, after the eight weeks were assigned to do whatever we were going to do. The, comp the guy at a big company meeting says, well, we're lucky. Um, Fort Polk, Louisiana was a, a definite stepping stone for the military to go to Vietnam for the infantry. He says, out of this company, because they've been having, you know, 40, 50 percent of the companies go to Fort Polk. Um, he says, only five guys in the company are going to go to Fort Polk. And I uh, sigh, sigh of relief thinking, 
oh, my, my odds are really good now. Uh, but I was one of those five. <laughs> but the interesting thing was my friend that I went in with on assigned also. Um, this is a kid I used to in kindergarten, used to go in and, during recess at school to help him with his colors on the chart on the wall. Finds out when he's in the infantry or in the army um, being tested, he didn't have to go in the infantry because he was colorblind. <laughs> you saw how um, how overreactive the military was, the powers to be with their with all their artillery. I mean, we just devastated that country. Craters all over the place. I mean, just we just were so bomb happy and so um, um, trigger happy to, to shoot anything that you know they could and so forth. Um, and it just didn't seem right. Part of our company was on the other side of the village. They thought the gunfire was at them. So they started shooting. And then some of our guys started shooting back at them. So by the time we were trying to get it cleared up that, no, this is not where we're, we're calm down. We're shooting at each other. They'd already called in gunships. Now, these gunships are the helicopters with all the rockets and, and, and the Cobra helicopters were nothing but, you know, firepower. And they came and they and they attacked the village with us. I mean, they they just uh, attacked the village because they um, supposedly that village was you know uh, being aggressive towards us, which they weren't. It wasn't happening. Um, the next morning, we had to go into that village to look for I, they. I and and as I'm on the radio talking and trying to tell them that you know there's we're not taking this is not gunfire from the village. Um, by the time the the attack was over on the on, on the village, um, I'm trying to raise questions with them. Um, next morning, somebody the, the higher up said, "Well, okay, you got to go in." And they were, I think they were a little nervous. And they wanted us to go in to find the spent rounds from the village, all the you know ammunition that was shot at us, which there was none. We didn't, we never found any. I mean, but you saw these people that were just you know fried. Um, and that was, and that's when I said, "This is crazy. Um, this is this is this is crazy how we're doing this." They told us to pack up. We're going out for days, and and put it, bring enough food for like five days. Well, first of all, <laughs> you, well, I don't, any movie I've ever watched, of, any, any you know, movies of the army moving so forth, the guys were never loaded up like pack meals like we had to be. I mean, you, I had to care. And they, when they tell you to put, bring five, you know, days of food, that was probably the longest time they ever told us we had to carry because we couldn't get resupplied. Um, now I had to carry a radio, which was twenty five pounds, an extra battery, which is the size of a brick, my own gun, ammunition, my clips of ammunition, plus um, if you, to, for a little self-preservation, maybe a couple of grenades, plus I had to carry the smoke grenades because when we dust off guys, when we call in a helicopter for a dust off for somebody, I'd, I'd have to throw out different colored smoke to let the helicopter know where we were and um, the right location and so forth. And then and then sort through these boxes of all this food they give you to take what you could realistically carry, along with your water. Small town pine plains. I you know I'm released in Oakland, California, to uh, to get on a flight to drive and fly to JFK, and my father and brother picked me up down there. So I didn't you know I wasn't out in the public in any place other than back in Pine Plains, and nobody nobody disrespected you or, or called you anything or did anything and if anything um um i was more vocal about that we shouldn't be in vietnam so so i didn't have any problem with with some of the um the way guys talk about oh it was terrible coming home because nobody you know they, they accused you of doing all these bad things and so forth and because i was right along with it i was i you know, we're, we're, i don't think we should be there so Anytime I hear hear a helicopter, <laughs> um, it really it really has an effect. There was not there was never a better sound in the world than hearing that helicopter coming to to to, to get you out of a spot where you're you know um, and going to land and bring you back to the base for a while. Um, that was to hear the helicopter coming or one that's coming to help support because um, once once the helicopter showed up, the ambush was over. 
I'm Curtis Simmons, and I'm a lifelong resident of the Pine Plains area here in New York. <laughs>